this passage currently holds on this 2 million and 73rd day of the year of COVID-19, it currently holds the number one spot for things pastors regret complaining about in the time before the Rona. That's what this story is, right? A disturbance in the worship service, an interrupted sermon. And who among us right now wouldn't want a sermon interrupted as we record and stream worship services these days? Our congregation has not met in person for worship since early March because of the pandemic. So these days it's just me, my director of communications and the camera in the sanctuary. No one is dropping hymnals. No one is loudly unwrapping candy. No one is blowing their nose or trying to clear their throat in a way that would register on the Richter scale. People, people think children are disruptive during church, but it's really adults. Adults are so loud. I've never had a child's cell phone ring in the middle of a prayer and then again during the sermon. But adults, y'all, they are the noisiest. It's possible that that's what Jesus thought he, as he was preaching that day in the synagogue. Ugh, adults. It really doesn't take much time in the pulpit to learn this lesson, even though, uh, according to Mark, this is just the second sermon Jesus preached. It's likely Jesus had already discovered just how loud adults can be. The Gospel of Mark moves pretty quickly. Remember, we're only in the first chapter, but Jesus has already picked up some disciples. They immediately went to Capernaum, where the first thing Jesus does is go to church, which you know made his mama so proud. By verse 25, that's just 25 verses into the first chapter, Jesus performs an exorcism. I mean, that escalated pretty quickly. But before this exorcism, Jesus preaches. We aren't given the sermon manuscript. The sermon was not recorded, not uploaded to Vimeo, not available for download as a podcast, but it would be great. It would be so great to know exactly what Jesus said. I mean, after all, according to the text, it must have been really good. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Maybe it was the length. If this sermon was based on Jesus' first sermon, it was probably very brief. Jesus' first sermon was fewer than 20 words. It's in verse 15 in the first chapter of Mark. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, and here's the sermon, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. A sermon in 20 words. Uh, preachers, just as an aside, I would recommend that you do not point that out to your congregation because who knows what kind of ideas they might have. And we, we don't really know how long this second sermon went, but we know that it was off to a good start. We are told that the people were astounded but we're going to have to come back to this because it's just after we are told the people were astounded that the sermon is interrupted. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. The man made a ruckus, or the story says that the spirit within him made a ruckus. The demon-possessed man is loud and disruptive until Jesus commands the spirit to come out of him. For some, demon possession is real, part of the unseen forces of good and evil, and Jesus' response has become a model for what to do when possession is suspected. For others, possession just isn't a believable scenario, although as Fred Craddock once noted, not believing in demons has hardly eradicated evil in our world. 
But of course, even for those of us who aren't sure about demons or unclean spirits, possession is not quite as foreign an event as we pretend it to be. For most of us have had firsthand experience with it. Most of us have been possessed by jealousy or envy that has made us stingy or ungrateful. Some of the most shocking cases of possession happen when people are behind the wheel of a vehicle. Someone doesn't use their blinker or takes too long to make a turn and all of a sudden we're speculating on the character of that person's mother, which we would never do any, under any other circumstances except that we have been possessed by the raw power of driving a car. It is often theorized that what was described as demon possession or possession by an unclean spirit in the ancient world was really a mental health struggle or some other illness that hadn't been yet identified. It is sometimes suggested that this man was a person with schizophrenia or undiagnosed as bipolar. It is certainly possible. We know so much more about brain health these days and what influences behavior that We just assume that's what Mark was really describing. We should be careful though about diagnosing the man in the biblical text with mental illness, especially if it is just because we do not believe in demon possession. Mental illness gets blamed for all sorts of things, most notably mass shootings, but studies show that the convenient cries of mental illness after mass shootings are factually wrong and stigmatize people with mental health concerns. People with mental illness are more likely to be victims of violence, including violence committed by police. One of the reasons mental illness is used to explain away unthinkable violence is because most mass shooters are white men. If the shooter is black or brown, we are supposed to believe the narrative that it's because black culture is inherently violent or non-Christian ideology is inherently violent. But when the shooter is white, we comfort ourselves by saying he must have been crazy because otherwise we would have to take a hard look at straight white masculinity and why we won't cast it out of our lives. But back to when the sermon was interrupted. It was right after, immediately, the text says, right after we are told that they were astounded at his teaching. Astounded. Now that is what preachers want the congregation to say in the receiving line post-worship. Astounded. It sounds like it comes with fireworks and a pay raise. No weary preaching from Jesus. He astounded them. In the Greek, the word astounded is ekpleso, ekpleso. And this is actually our cue that an exorcism is next, for ekpleso means to expel by a blow, to drive out or away, to strike one out of self-possession. Let me say that again, to astound is to strike one out of self-possession. So perhaps no one was patting Jesus on the back and telling him what a great sermon it was, for he had astounded them. He had cast something out of them. It's, It's kind of a miracle only one person interrupted the sermon. So with that in mind, Reimagine with me, if you will, that Sabbath so long ago that the sermon Jesus preached, what the people eventually called a new teaching, that sermon providentially hindered the status quo that day. It expelled privilege and dogma. It was what we call the good news, which is good news to the poor and to the marginalized anyway, but not necessarily good news to the comfortable and the privileged, which could be why it doesn't get preached in too many white churches today, wouldn't want to offend anyone. But Jesus did not worry about taking it 
easy on church people. He just preached the good news. And not surprisingly, they were astounded at his teaching, which is to say it was upsetting to a few in the congregation. In fact, one man was so upset, he began yelling, accusing Jesus of trying to destroy them. Or in modern church vernacular, he was threatened by the challenge to dogma and doctrine and was opposed to the suggestion that things be done differently than the way they had always been done. But here's the thing, Jesus, didn't back down. Jesus raised his eyebrows, channeled his Magnificat singing mama, and held fast to the good news. Jesus, seeing that there was a person underneath all that self-possession, called that self-possession out of the congregation and out of that man. No wonder the man started yelling. He had heard something that moved him deep inside. I don't, I don't know what was so offensive to him in particular, but I can certainly name a few things that caused disturbances in today's church. Try taking the American flag out of the sanctuary or replacing pictures of white Jesus with images of the brown-skinned Middle Eastern Jew that he was. The man survived, you know, without that privilege. It wasn't who he was anyway. It was a cover, a security blanket. There was a human being under all that privilege, all that self-possession, finally recognizable when it was moved aside. In church speak, we call what happened salvation. So maybe we don't need the manuscript from Jesus' sermon that day. Perhaps Mark knew that we would have plenty of dogma and ideology and privilege and self-possession to expel, to cast out. So preachers, if you need a sign that now is the time, consider that we are so very close to a national holiday which celebrates freedom from tyranny for some Americans. It is an excellent time for us to declare a new independence. It is just the right time for us to think about what we need to break free from, those things that we should cast out of our churches and out of our hearts. It'll be like an exorcism, for as Harry Condobola says, the last place the colonizer leaves is your mind. So to borrow a line from our teacher Jesus, come out of them. Oh, that we would all be astounded. Amen. And now let us close with a word of blessing. Now may the power of God and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really does surpass all our understanding, go with every one of us, abiding in us, lifting us up and making us whole. Let us go in peace, pray for peace, wage a little peace, and love one another, every single other. Amen.